So hepatitis from the name you can tell inflammation of the liver. Usually this inflammation arises from an infection from the hepatitis family of viruses. So hepatitis A, B, C, D, or E. But you can also have other causes of hepatitis, including a viral infection from the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, or cytomegalovirus, CMV, or you can have hepatitis from an autoimmune problem. Now, normally, looking at just the hepatitis viruses, normally, they all can all cause acute disease, so acute symptoms, acute infection. However, a couple of them can actually persist and end up causing chronic liver disease, so that's BCD. All of those can cause chronic disease. So the nice way to remember that is that acute is only is acute only is from the A and E viruses. And BCD can persist, cause chronic disease. And I made the C one a little darker here because hepatitis C is much more likely to cause chronic disease than hepatitis B or D. Now clinical features, I've already talked a little bit about this. So do you remember what clinical features of acute hepatitis there might be? Well, first of all, there's inflammation, the viral infection, so you can have infectious symptoms, such as a fever or malaise. You can have abdominal symptoms, such as nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, so general stuff. And then you have obstructive jaundice symptoms. What was obstructive jaundice? I remember I talked so much about it. Remember, obstructive jaundice was, for, was uh, jaundice, dark urine, peristool, pruritus. And you get, um, for your labs, you get elevated liver enzymes. ALT more than AST, and how about how about that? Uh, what other liver? What other um, lab will you see? See hyperbilirubinemia, and was that conjugated or unconjugated or both? Remember this was both because you get damage to liver cells and you get damage to bowel ducts. So again, often asymptomatic, but can be a combination of infectious symptoms, abdominal symptoms, obstructive jaundice, and then these characteristic lab findings. All right, chronic hepatitis, usually it's mild and non-specific symptoms. Um, and this chronic inflammation can lead to cirrhosis. So that's why that's what we're seeing here. It's cirrhosis etiology, it's chronic viral hepatitis. Okay. Now let's take a look at the hepatitis viruses a little more closely. We're going to look at their uh, the way they're transmitted and additional things to know. So hepatitis A is a fecal oral transmission, usually from undercooked self shellfish or other foods especially if the food handler is infected. So often at restaurants, someone has hepatitis A, he spreads that virus to you and you eat that food, you're gonna get hepatitis A. Now the presence of IgM antibodies against hepatitis A, what does that tell you? It tells you that the patient has an acute hepatitis, so they're making the IgM antibody to fight it, okay? What about if there's a IgM, IgG antibody against hepatitis A. This basically means that the patient either has um, had prior infection and they successfully fought it off and now they have that, that immunity to it or they were vaccinated against it. So again, both ways they have H hepatitis A, um, IgG antibody protection. Okay, so that's a recurring theme. IgM will be the acute stuff. IgG will either be from um, prior infection or vaccination giving them um, prophylactic immunity. Hepatitis B, transmission from sex, drugs, or childbirth, okay? Sex, drugs, childbirth. That's just basically travels through blood, either from sex, from the little tears in your sexual, in the sexual mucosa, from, from um, what is it, the IV, IV drug use, or from childbirth from the mother to the child. And the chronic hepatitis, as I said, develops in some cases. Hepatitis C, drugs, blood donation. Blood donation le much less common now thanks to blood screening, but still happens. So want to note that it can still happen through sexual transmission, hepatitis C, but it's much more less, much less common than for hepatitis B. And then again, chronic hepatitis develops in most cases for hepatitis C infection. Hepatitis D, it's very similar to hepatitis B. Okay, same transmission, sex, drugs, childbirth. The key thing here is that hepatitis D only infects people who already have hepatitis B. Why is that? And it's because hepatitis D can't make its own envelope protein. It cannot make its envelope protein its own, so it cannot survive on its own. What it does do is it jacks, it steals hepatitis B's envelope protein. So the only way it survives is if hepatitis B is present as well, so it can steal hepatitis B 
and envelope protein. And what happens is, because it's infecting a person already, already infected with hepatitis B, you get a super infection. Okay? A super infection is much nastier than a regular hepatitis B infection. You get much more severe and rapidly damaging liver infection. You can pro progress to liver failure very quickly Okay, when you have the super infection of a hepatitis D on top of hepatitis B. Finally, hepatitis E. This again is a fecal oral. So again, these two are pretty similar. Fecal oral and these two are pretty similar. Okay. Normally, this is an acute, uh, normal acute infection. Um, just re re reviewing the symptoms again. What was acute um, symptoms of acute vi hep viral hepatitis? Remember, infectious symptoms, abdominal symptoms like abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, um, and then you can have obstructive jaundice. We talked a lot about that. We have those lab findings. Now, however, if the patient is a pregnant woman, that's a whole totally different case. Uh, for some reason, it can cause a much more severe disease, kind of like the hepatitis D super infection. Get a fulminant hepatitis or a super severe rapid onset liver injury. Okay. Now, we talked a little bit about hepatitis A serology with that um, and IgM antibody, IgA antibody. I want to talk about serology for hepatitis B. So now we're only talking about hepatitis B now. Okay, we're focusing on hepatitis B. There's a lot of things on the blood work that we can look for. First thing is hepatitis B surface antigen. Okay, H is antigen, S is for surface. This is an antigen on the surface of hepatitis B. And if you look on the picture on the right, it's this thing on the right. This is antigen on the surface. And its presence indicates, obviously, that you have hepatitis B virus. You have an, and thus, you have an acute infection. Okay. Now, you can develop antibodies to this hepatitis B surface antigen. Okay, that's an anti-H hepatitis B surface antibody. This is an IG, uh, IgG antibody. Okay, it looks like this. And its presence, it, IgG indicates immunity. You get this either from a recent infection or from vaccination, and this has a protective effect. Okay. Presence of anti-hepatitis B surface antibody is indicative of either a recent infection, again, completely done with, or being vaccinated. You do not have this during, during an active hepatitis B infection. Okay. Next is hepatitis C antigen, that's core antigen. This is on the right, it's, it's the core, it's an antigen inside the hepatitis C, hepatitis B. Um, that's all you know about it. Now you can have an antibody against that as well. That antibody can either be an IgM or IgG. Same deal, IgM means an acute slash recent infection. IgG either means you have a prior infection, you had, you had an infection before of hepatitis B, or you have a chronic infection, okay? IgG is chronic or prior, IgM is acute or recent. Now we'll look at hepatitis E antigen, which is right here, this stuff. And the significance of this, it's a protein that's present only during active replication. So if it's present, it means you have an active infection and there's high transmissibility. Okay, if you see hepatitis E antigen, active replication, high transmit transmittability. However, if you have an antibody against that, that actually means you have reduced risk of transmission. Okay. One more thing I want to talk about. This is the window period. Okay. This is the period between disappearance of the hepatitis B surface antigen, because that's eventually going to get eradicated, and the development and appearance of the antibody against the surface antigen. That's the IgG anti-hepatitis um, surface antigen antibody. Thus, you will have neither marker present when you do testing. And often, the only marker present during this period is the IgM anti-hepatitis B core antibody. Okay. That's just that's just what I want you to know. It's so don't be confused. If you only see that, that means you're in the window period. You're in that period between the time of disappearance of the uh, eradication of that surface antigen and the development of that future protective antibody. No, I'm going to test you on this. This is a very good way of really ensuring that you understand all the serology. So during acute infection, what of these serologies will be positive? That's the question. So will you have surface antigen? The answer is yes, you do have surface antigen. Remember that in just in indicates the presence of hepatitis B virus. Will you have the 
E antigen, hepatitis B E antigen. Yes, remember that's acute infection, or re when it's reproducing, you see this. Now, will you have a antibody against the core antibody? And will it be IgM or IgG? There's an acute infection, so which one will it be? It's going to be IgM. Okay. Now, will there be an antibody against hepatitis B surface antigen? The answer is no. Remember, I said it is not ever present during. Uh, during the infection, and it's only present afterwards, so no. Okay. Window period, what do you see? Is there any um, surface antigen? No, I told you, remember, that's the window period is defined as the time between when that appears and presentation of the antibody against the surface antigen. Is there any E antigen? No, because your um, E is only during active replication, and we've gotten rid of the surface antigen, and, um, and the hepatitis B virus, so no. Is there any core antibody? And it will be IgM or IgG. Remember, it's going to be IgM because IgM is during acute or recent infection. And will there be any hepatitis B surface antibody? No, because it's taking time to be developed and it hasn't, during this window period, it hasn't been made yet. Okay, what about a chronic infection? Is there any surface antigen? Yes, because you have, you have an infection, you have hepatitis B present, so there's surface antigen. Is there any E antigen? The answer is no, because it's, it's just a chronic infection. It's not an acute infection. There's no super high viral replication. Will there be any um, core antibodies in the IgM or IgG? Where is IgG? It's chronic infection. Is there any surface antibodies? Well, remember, you still have, you're still infected, so no. Remember, surface antibody only when you're done with the infection or you're vaccinated. Now we have a resolved, in, um, resolved hepatitis B virus, hepatitis. Is there any surface antigen? No, it's resolved. Is there any E antigen? No, it's resolved. Is there any uh, anti-core antibody? Yes. Remember, it's going to be IgG. IgG is in either resolved or chronic states. Um, now, finally, is there any surface antibody? And yes, there is going to be a IgG surface antibody. It's resolved. There's been enough time, and now you have protective development and protection. Finally, immunization. There's nothing present except for the antibodies because there's no there's no actual virus. You just were immunized to it. So no, 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 no. And yes, there's IgG because we developed protection against the hepatitis B virus. So that's it for our hepatitis lecture. Uh, make sure, don't try to memorize this, just understand what each of these are, what each of these are, and how the, uh, whether they'll be present in these different periods of uh, hepatitis B virus infection.